Um, we're really pleased to have uh, Josh Gray uh, from NC State to talk to our colloquium today. Before we do that, um, because of the interest that Twitter garnered for this, uh, this talk, I just wanted to give a quick background. This is our CENREP, which is the Center for Environmental and Resource Economic Policy Colloquium. So this is our, uh, our sort of more practical hands-on type uh, talks for our, intended for our faculty and our, our grad students here at, at NC State. Um, but while I have so many people from a variety of different institutions, and I had a chance to sort of meet you guys through the invitation process, we have a lot of junior people here as well and environmental eco economists. Uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't advertise uh, our center and uh, a couple of things that we do. So uh, every August annually for a long time um, until this last year, we held a workshop called Camp Resources for uh, grad students and junior faculty to get feedback on their work. We have usually have like a tutorial session and it's usually held in a, you know, sort of getaway location here in North Carolina, either Asheville or at the beach. Uh, we are tentatively planning to do that uh, in Asheville, August 9th or 10th, um, or potentially virtually uh, if that doesn't work out. So nothing definitive yet, but please either follow our CENREP uh, Twitter handle or go, go to our website for updates. Um, we also run the Tree Seminar, which is hosted by ourselves, Duke and RTI International, which has environmental econ speakers. Um, and because of the virtual nature of that, we've made that uh, available to everyone. So uh, please check that out. And then Finally, this colloquium, this is only our sort of second one that we've advertised more broadly, but because of all the interest, uh, we'll potentially do um, some more in the fall. Uh, so I've just been floating around something on, on machine learning, environmental justice, uh, or another topic in diff and diff like we did in our earlier one. So again, if you're interested in that, follow myself or our uh, CENREP Twitter account. So with that, I'll shut up and let uh, Josh talk about uh, remote sensing and what economists need to know about it. So Josh, please take it away. Thanks very much for the uh, introduction, Eric, and the opportunity to be here and, and speak to you guys. Thanks for everyone for um, showing up. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and see if I can get going here. Been a couple of months since I've presented to an actual audience on Zoom, so um, appreciate in advance your uh, uh, grace and patience with me as, as I get going. So um, as Eric mentioned, today I'd like to talk about um, just a general overview of remote sensing, kind of a um, crash course on how it works, um, what's available, and some things you might need to know if you were to dare to use these sorts of data uh, for your own projects. So let's start with um, a couple of little vignettes of the, the power of remote sensing. What we're looking at here is a digital elevation model or a DEM. It's a particular type of elevation model called a bare earth DEM where anything except the hard stuff close to the surface has been wiped away. So all the vegetation and stuff has been wiped away. And as you can see, it looks like some sort of ruins, right? There's some pyramid complex. Um, and, and things that look um, perhaps uh, South American, um, Central American. And in fact, this is the Mayan city of Caracol. Um, it was flown with LIDAR, and I say flown because it, it was on an airplane, not an on, not on orbital platform, which most of the talk will be about orbital platforms, but now we have orbital LIDARs. But anyway, about five years ago, maybe a little bit longer, they flew this area and the understanding, it's not an exaggeration at all, but just to say the understanding of this site changed in hours from the, from the time of the flight. So there was about a two hour flight collecting data over this area, um, and then a couple of hours of pre-processing. And when the first images came through, instantly the scientific archeological understanding of this site changed. So what you can see is a lot, a lot of terraced agriculture. They had mapped previously. Now, now let's just say that this, this particular site had been studied for close to 100 years, um, continuous 
excavation and study. So people have been walking all over this area, um, trying to figure out what was there and, and map that for, for a very long time indeed. And in a mere number of hours, a hundred times more terraced agriculture had been mapped. Uh, something like a thousand more structures and buildings have been mapped. Um, a lot of different reservoirs. And so what was thought, you know, a couple of hours ago to be a sort of minor site, uh, maybe a trading post stop along a, a trading route, um, transformed this the, the understanding into that this was a very central and important city. Um, and so one of the reasons that it was thought, uh, it, it was misunderstood stood previously was because this top panel kind of shows a transect that you can see on the bottom through the site. So what we see here on the bottom is the bare earth DEM. So when we've wiped away all the vegetation is the top is looking at it through the side. You can see the outline here along the bottom of the temple, the pyramid itself. But on top, you see a lot of vegetation, right? So this is the returns, so laser returns um, that, that from, from each individual leaf or branch or things like that. So you can kind of see why you couldn't see it, <laughs> even walking along the ground, um, just covered in dense foliage. So remote sensing allowed us to wipe away the foliage here and truly see something that, that you couldn't see. And, and for hundreds of years, people had been on top of, literally, and had not seen. Um, so that shows one of the, the powers of remote sensing in that it gives us new ways to see things or, or gives us new modalities of observation. Uh, that were previously unavailable. Just one more little vignette before we really hit the ground here. You may have noticed a couple of years ago, um, Twitter and uh, the popular media blew up um, with a recognition that the Amazon was on fire. And it's a really big deal, right? As you can see from these tweets, a lot of concern, a lot of alarm. Um, you know, some, some messed up numbers, I guess, on the, the amount of oxygen that it produced, but, but that, we'll set that aside. But all of a sudden it was in the public awareness and you would have thought <laughs> that this is the first time that the Amazon had caught fire. Um, but in reality, the Amazon burns every year. And we know that because, well, people are there <laughs> and have been burning it. So a lot of times remote sensing is called the art of illuminating the obvious. So, um, but, what a remote sensing allows us to do is in a very consistent manner and in an exhaustive wall-to-wall -wall manner, map all the fires that have happened over the past, um, past years and through decades. So here we just show the last 10 years of the Amazon fire season by month. This graphic created by the New York Times, which actually has a, a really great uh, data visualization department. And so you can see on the top, there was nothing you know, on the face exceptional about the fires in August that generated so much uh, popular media appreciation. Um, it burns in this season. There's a fire season in the Amazon. August was kind of the, the, the start of it. Um, it. It seems like it may have been worse in other years. It doesn't look particularly bad. Um, so, okay, so we're starting to peel back some layers of the onion here and tell a little bit better story by virtue of, of the consistency of remote sensing. Another thing we can do, not just say what's on fire, right? Now the top graph shows the fire counts by day of year and the red line being 2019, the blue lines being uh, six sort of random years um, before that. Yeah, random in that they, they probably are representative of the, the, the population. Um, so what we see though, is that, yeah, it was tending to have a, probably a little more fires in terms of raw number of, of, of individual fires than an average year or typically expected. But then we can see something that we can't see on the ground. We could count fires and maybe even map their perimeter on the ground, but it's hard to get a, a good observations, at least over large areas of the radiative power, the intensity of the fire. And one thing that stood out about 2019 is that the fires were a lot more intense, right? So again, the power remote sensing in this context is in the consistency, both over space and over time, we can look back over the previous 10 uh, decades and see uh, what's been going on and compare that to, to e any individual year and say, hey, is, is this normal or are things extraordinarily different? We can also see things that we can't see. Again, like the Mayan uh, ruins example, we can see the radiative power of the fire. We know how hot they're burning and that tells us a lot about the causes of the fires. And this mapping puts it all those pieces together, right? So what we can see, the green is existing forest, yellow are areas that have been deforested prior to 2018, and then the red dots are the fires in 2019. So remote sensing by virtue of being able to see everything wall to wall and everything consistently, 
we can we can see the pat spatial pattern which gives us clues about where the fires why the fires are happening and we see them predominantly on the margins of existing forests in areas previously deforested giving us clues that this fire season is being sparked <laughs> pardon the I, unintentionally bad pun. Uh, this this is being driven by agricultural expansion and burning of the slash uh, that results from that. So um, the this these two little vignettes I think give us a good example of the power of remote sensing and why a lot of you are probably here. Um, it gives us frequent, consistent data for everywhere, right? So we can look at the entire globe now, not just where we're able to. Um, go out and collect data in the field. Completely new ways of seeing things, right? So the LIDAR example, wiping away the forest and, and discovering new things under there. There's ways of mapping uh, underground water using gravitometric measurements. So truly things, ways of seeing things that we can't see or can't measure otherwise. And then also combining that with doing it everywhere consistently all the time. The moment we're at right now though, and the focus of the talk today is that we're in that era of products. So what I mean by products is that no longer do you need to work with a remote sensing scientist or be a remote sensing scientist yourself to generate useful data, uh, application ready, analysis ready data from remotely sensed observations. And so here we can see an example of a typical product, which is a land cover of croplands product um, for a little inset in South Dakota showing uh, for this particular year our best guesses about what was grown on each of those fields. But <laughs> it's not always right and bad maps look as good as good maps. <laughs> and on top of all of that, because remote sensing is a space high-tech technology, there's an appeal to authority uh, people like maps. Maps look very authoritative. When they come from remote sensing, there's a whole added layer of technological sophistication, which lends credence to the maps that maybe it doesn't completely deserve. And so here, um, this is a product that I'll pick on a little bit um, called the Global um, Croplands uh, Layer, uh, GFSAD, if you're interested in it. Um, the green areas are supposed are meant to show croplands, and this is a global product, and the the pixel sizes are about thirty meters, so it is um, a lot of very useful data. But if you look in any particular area, like here we're looking at Rome, you might be surprised to find out the extent of croplands in the in the municipality of Rome. So clearly there are some problems here. We don't have crops growing along the streets. Via Borghese is not a large um, barley field, as the map would tell us. So I want to delve into where where these errors come from. But before we get there, um, we just talk about the the state of remote sensing. What's up there, and kind of go through a really quick crash course and how it all works. So right now, um, never a better time for for Earth observation. The Earth orbits are getting busier and busier every every minute. And we have right now about 2,600 something satellites, uh, artificial satellites uh, orbiting Earth. The vast majority of those came from the, are launched by the United States, but other countries are beginning to catch up. Uh, those, that includes all types of satellites from GPS to um, communication satellites. We have satellites that are observing the sun, but about 700 of those are Earth observation satellites. There's a lot of different stuff up there. So here's a cool graphic from NASA showing the status of uh, current and planned Earth science missions, uh, orbital Earth science missions. So we can see the constellation of NASA Earth observation. Now, each of these satellites has a different suite of sensors. Some satellites only carry one sensor. Some satellites carry uh, you know, a dozen different types of sensors. They're all making different sorts of observations. So some just see what our eyes can see. Some see things that our eyes can't see out further in different wavelengths uh, of the electromagnetic spectrum. So there's a whole bunch of stuff up there right now and they all are up there for a purpose. Um, about, like I said, about 700 of them are observing the earth and taking different types of measurements that we hope to be able to take advantage of. So the current state, right? Pretty polluted orbit right now. A lot of earth observation satellites uh, the biggest growth in this in in the recent um, decade has been in commercial satellites. So many of us have heard of uh, Planet. It used to be Planet Labs. Now it's just Planet. 
a company that's launched this constellation of microsatellites and are, and are providing data that, that we actually use in, in my own group, but are used throughout, um, throughout industry and academics. So there's a, it's an exciting time right now um, in remote sensing. And as I said, we're in the product area, product era, which means that we have a lot of ready to use higher level data sets that are intended for applications directly. And here I've just screenshot two of the kind of clearing houses that can show you some of the vast array of products available. Uh, on the left, the MODIS data products table. Now these are all products derived from one sensor um, called MODIS. There's actually two MODISes or MODI. <laughs> Uh, on board two separate satellites. Um, there's an afternoon and an and a, uh, eve, I mean a morning and an afternoon overpass satellite for different purposes. Uh, but we can generate a wide array of data products that people are interested in from there. So all the satellites do is kind of just tell us how bright the surface is um, in a particular wavelength region. That's literally the only thing that they do. So if you want to do anything with that, you know, land cover, or you want to know how many leaves are in a particular place, or you want to know the land surface temperature, something like that. Um, then you have to manipulate those data further. Google Earth Engine has um, been a real revolution um, in data accessibility. And, um, and here we can see just the top, you know, alphabetically or listed data products available in the Earth Engine data catalog. So Earth Engine has been transformative because it's put all of the data on spinning disk um, for you already. You don't have to download the data, pre-process the data, munge or harmonize the data together uh, to create your own products. You can just grab them in one line of code on Earth Engine and start working with them. And there's a lot of different products available there for you. Here's some examples of some products. Modus Land Cover, uh, uh, upper left. This is probably the single most used satellite derived data product um, in existence. Um, almost all downstream applications require land cover, right? We gotta know what type of thing is in which place, right? So this just broadly maps, what is forest, what is barren, what is water, um, what are croplands across the whole globe? Um, down below that, another one coming from MODIS, uh, which is a NASA instrument, uh, the leaf area index. So this is just how many leaves are in a particular place, right? Um, Upper right, something that some of you will be familiar with, the forest change maps, global forest change products uh, from Matt Hansen's group at the University of Maryland. Really fantastic new product at uh, pretty high resolution. I, it's a relative term, but that means about 30 meters in these cases, um, showing where forest cover has increased and decreased. And it even tells us the year in which the forest cover was lost, which is a really fantastic product. Um, and then just to show something distinct from, from some of the others, which are focused on vegetation. Uh, nighttime lights products. Uh, we get this from a new satellite um, called VIRS. It carries a special instrument called the day night band, which um, gives us pretty startlingly high accuracy um, measurements of the brightness of the land surface at night. Now that they create really pretty maps, um, but it's also been used pretty extensively to map um, Tan economically tangential sort of things like um, you know infrastructure increases and population densities and changes over time. Then there's a whole new era of commercial sort of products that are coming about. These are ones that you can't load up here in, in Google Earth Engine, and there's just a smattering of uh, products on offer from Orbital Insight. So these are just really high level products from high resolution satellites. They're tracking the number of cars in Walmart parking lots. They're actually able to map the amount of oil in these strategic oil reserves, because as you can see in the top right, um, they have this floating lid. And based on the shadows, you can tell how deep the lid is. And from the shadow on the, of the tank itself, you can see how far down it is. So you can actually get a pretty accurate estimate of the amount of oil in there. So um, there's some things on Earth's surface that you can't hide from the satellites. And so there's people working hard to, to pull treasure out of these. Um, out of these data sets. And on the bottom right is foot traffic, which is a fairly new product that they've rolled out, which is just uh, pretty amazing that from space, we could start to estimate you know, when and where people are, uh, even when they're on foot. So there's a whole bunch of products available now um, from remote sensing. But for the remainder of this talk, I want to sort of peel back the curtain a little bit and, um, and take a peek inside the sausage factory and see how these these products are made because I think it's important to understand as an end user some of the, the steps involved in that process and, and when things go wrong and, and what causes them to go wrong. Um, 
So first we'll start with just, you know, the crash course in, in sensors uh, and satellites. How do they work? Well, they're pretty complex, as you can see. Um, they're pretty high tech engineering sort of stuff, but you can kind of condense it all down that these satellite sensors are just a, a camera, a kind of a very special camera, but a camera nonetheless, uh, plus some sort of propellant to keep them in a particular orbit and a radio to talk back to earth and, and tell us what they found, okay? So it's pretty simple uh, once you wipe away everything uh, else. So we've got these things and they're orbited around the earth taking pictures. This is what the orbits kind of look like. This one is for uh, Aqua, which is one of the satellites carrying the MODIS sensor that I previously mentioned. And the red line shows um, the swath, which is what we call the stripe of earth that it can see as it orbits the earth. Um, so you can see each orbit is about 90 minutes. This satellite is about 740 kilometers above earth, which is a highly trafficked orbit that we call uh, LEO, low, low Earth orbit. Most of the sensors that we'll talk about today uh, or the products that, that we'll talk about today derive from sensors in low Earth orbit. It has a lot of advantages. The principal advantage is that when it crosses the equator, it does so at the same local solar time, which means that the illumination, aside from seasonality differences and latitudinal differences, the, seasonal, the, the illumination is as consistent as possible. This is the main feature of low Earth orbit that, that makes it the most populated orbit. Much further out, 36,000 kilometers away, we have geostationary orbit, and that sees the full disk. Now that's a special place because that means in that orbit, you're orbiting at the same speed that the Earth is turning. So you stay fixed over the same place. Those sorts of sensors are typically um, used for meteorological purposes, um, but we have an interesting new suite of sensors out there that can be used for um, other sort of Earth observation. Uh, applications as well. So just to understand how the orbits work, where they are, most of the stuff is either 700 kilometers or 36,000 kilometers away. The stuff that's in 700 kilometers away, it sees the whole, uh, you know, it makes a full lap around Earth every 90 minutes. But how much of Earth it sees, the width of that swath is determined um, by the sensor properties. And that varies considerably across different sensors. So as I said, all the sensors do is they have a camera and the radio and they translate the picture that they take into digital numbers and then they, or binary numbers, um, and they broadcast those back down to earth using their radio and we have to put an antenna up and listen. So what we wanna just quickly go through is how do we go from that, right? So just this stream of ones and zeros coming from the satellite to an image like this, this one of course um, showing the coast of North Carolina. So first we'll say, you know, what do these numbers actually represent? What, what are the numbers that, we're, that the satellite tells us? Uh, what do they represent? What do they mean? Um, well, we get things called digital numbers. So they just broadcast down these, these digital numbers. Um, we call them DNs, and that's the level zero sort of product uh, from the satellite. And all that is, is it tells us how bright the surface is. So that's correlated to the amount of photons that hit the little detectors in the satellite. So if a lot of photons hit, we get a big number. If a small number of photons hit, we get a smaller number. Um, those are, the sensors are designed in such a way that we can array those observations into individual pixel elements and create a wall-to-wall -wall mapping of Earth, each with its own digital number. But what we're typically interested in is not this digital number, which is pretty good relative measure of how many photons hit, but we're interested in how reflect, reflective is the surface. Um, the, that, Reflectance, surface reflectance, is the ratio of the incident versus the reflected radiation. Now, the problem is, is there's an atmosphere in between the sensor and the, the surface. So we have to estimate both how much uh, radiation was incident on that surface um, in order to understand how many of the how many the photon count that we get at the satellite to convert that to a reflectance, right? So we get this digital number, which is a measure of the radiance. We can convert that straightforward using calibration equations uh, that are determined for the sensor in the lab before they go on orbit. So we can relate a digital number to a number of photons, right, uh, within a particular spectral band. And then the radiance has to be converted to the surface reflectance um, by charting the path of a photon, all the different things that could happen to the photon. So when we go from radiance to surface reflectance, it's a process called atmospheric correction. Now, this is the first place where things go wrong, where we get errors. 
um, in the remotely since uh, instrument. Well, it's not the first place. They, the mechanical, the, the detectors are mechanical, right? So they have issues. Sometimes 10 photons hit them and you get a three and sometimes 10 photons hit them and you get a four, but um, we can, we, we have a pretty good handle on that. It's not a major source of error. Most of the error in our observations come from this process. So a lot of things can happen to the photons as they it leaves the, the sun, uh, it hits our atmosphere. A lot of the photons just get bounced right back out into space. Some of those that are bounced off the atmosphere actually hit our sensor too. So that's a photon that didn't interact with the surface but contributed to the radiance that we measured at the satellite. We'd like to be able to estimate how many of those are there. Likewise, uh, on the way back out, the same sort of things can happen. Some of the photons that are actually reflected off the surface are bounced back into a different place. We even have photons that are coming from areas outside of the area that we're looking at because of multiple scattering, right? So we do our best to estimate all of these different um, uh, components of the radiative uh, transfer, the path of these photons, in order to go for, to, from a, a relative measurement of just how many photons to something that is consistent, um, which is surface reflectance. So we need to account for uh, where the sun is, the seasons, how far away the sun is from Earth, the angle of the sun from the, from the surface, the angle of the satellite from the surface, the uh, properties of the atmosphere, how many aerosols are there, how much stuff is there for the photons to run into. At every stage here, there's opportunity for errors to leak their uh, way in. We sum all those up and we call these radiometric errors, right? So these are just the errors um, in estimating surface reflectance uh, from the things that we measure at the center. So again, what do the numbers represent? Well, it's this chain, right? We're measuring photons that produce a voltage change in a detector from which we uh, quantize to a digital number, which is a measure of radiance. And then with um, some estimation, we can go to a surface reflectance measurement. So most everything starts from a surface reflectance measurement, but just to get to there, we start to have some errors. Here's a difference between what we call top of atmosphere reflectance or converting radiance to reflectance and not accounting for anything in the atmosphere as if there was no atmosphere there, right? So this is just accounting for um, ang uh, angular effects of illumination and view angles versus the surface reflectance product at the bottom. So you can see the top looks uh, maybe not as sharp, even though they have the same spatial resolution, it looks a little bit hazy. That's a lot of path radiance. That's a lot of these photons that are hitting off the atmosphere and contaminating our sensor. So you can just see the effect of that straight away. The other thing we need to talk about is what do these numbers actually, uh, we, do, we know what they represent, well, where do they represent, okay? Um, so we have a pretty good idea of where the satellite is, but we don't, it's not perfect. Um, you know, they're, it's far away and it's moving very fast um, and its orbit is constantly being degraded by gravity and, and um, things like this. So um, we don't always know exactly where the satellite is, which means that we have a hard time knowing exactly where it's looking, right? In order for these products to be usable, uh, we need to know what reflectance are we looking at? What part of Earth are we at? So we need to, we have internal errors that are produced by the sensor system itself um, and the, the rotation of the Earth. We also have external errors that are caused by things like topography that vary through time. So we need to take this array of observations and fix them someplace on Earth and then do some subsequent alterations to figure out what area contributed, what area on Earth contributed the photons that, that form the basis of the measurement that I've made at the satellite. Um, one way we do this is with ground control points. So we look for really well-defined areas uh, in an image. So, uh, you know, a street intersection in high resolution imagery, a point or something like, like we see here and places that we know the location of on Earth very well and that we can also identify uh, fairly easily and accurately in a remotely sensed image. And then, you know, you can specify a transformation that skews, warps, and, and um, moves that image into the right place on Earth. But that's not all. Uh, we also don't live on a, uh, a beach ball. We have some lumps on Earth, and that, because of parallax effects and things like that, can distort where we actually think we're looking from. If you assume the Earth was a beach ball, you could have some large displacement errors, large geometric errors. Um, due to that. So then the next step is to take a really accurate digital elevation model of Earth and use that to transform the observations and put them in the right place. So the point is, um, 
we need to go from this image, which is an array that was um, of digital numbers. We do an orbital correction based on our best idea of where the satellite is. We register that image to somewhere on Earth using ground control points, places that we know where we are. And then we need some terrain correction. Just like the process of going from photons to surface reflectance, this process has the opportunity for errors at every step. This is something that we have a pretty good handle on. So you'll see the error reported for pixels in something like a half a pixel or something like that. So for Landsat, we know where that Landsat pixel is within you know, plus or minus five meters, but it's not exactly accurate. Um, that's on average, though. Um, sometimes there's bigger problems. We just are doing a reprocessing of the Landsat archive right now because when we tried to use it with another um, satellite product from uh, the European Space Agency, we found some very large errors, some errors over 35 meters, which is over the size of a Landsat pixel. So we sometimes don't know where we're looking, right? So, so keep that in mind as we go forward. These observations have different spatial resolution. Um, you probably all have a good handle on that. But over here, MODIS, 500 meter pixels, uh, Landsat uh, 8 over here, 30 meter pixels. So this shows that same area uh, on the coast of the Great Lakes here. Um, you show just the difference in the spatial resolution. So that, that has a lot to offer. Um, I mean, has a big impact on how you use these products, what types of products, and even what the products mean, right? Um, the spatial resolution, so just keep that in mind. There's also a radiometric resolution. So just how many different numbers can the, how, what's the precision of the instrument? So here you can see um, two levels of brightness all the way down to 12-bit data, which is Landsat 8 currently. And draw your attention to the, to the water itself. Just water is generally pretty dark. And so we have a hard time discriminating dark water from even darker water. But now we can do that a little bit better. But it all depends on just the precision of the instrument. Um, so there's you know, built-in uh, errors. There's trade-offs here, right? I mentioned the swath widths. It'd be nice to see everywhere all the time in high spatial resolution. But uh, technically, we can't, at least with a single satellite. So we can either. Uh, sweep out a very large swath like you see for MODIS here. So we can see, look uh, a lot to the left and a lot to the right and see a whole bunch of the area. But the consequence is that we don't see any particular place for very long. So we, there's only a, a very limited amount of time in which photons can interact with our detector and make an observation. And so we have to, um, to get uh, usable signal to noise ratios. We have to look over large areas, right, to get enough photons. Uh, Landsat uh, has kind of represents the other end of the spectrum where we look through a really narrow swath. Um, we're orbiting at the same exact speed, but because we're looking through a much narrower swath, the dwell time of the sensor on any particular place as it scans from left to right um, is a little bit longer. And so we can afford, you know, an order of magnitude higher resolution with Landsat. So that's 30 meter data. Um, so again, the reason we can't have usually <laughs> can't have fine pixels and frequent revisit time is because of single sensor systems have this trade-off uh, inherent. Those observations are made across the electromagnetic spectrum. So up on the upper left, you can see the boxes, the different colored boxes represent the wavelength regions in which we make individual or, or separate observations for a variety of different sensors, these being all Landsat sensors. Um, so, so you can see the blue box corresponds to around where our, what our eyes perceive as blue light, the green, the green, the red, the red. And then further out beyond what our eyes can see, we can only see up to about 700 nanometers here. But beyond that, we make observations out in the infrared, out in the middle infrared, and even out into the, the very far thermal infrared region. So we can see things that our eyes can't see, of course. And when we put together these multispectral observations or you know, the reflectance or brightness of the surface along in different portions of the electromagnetic spectrum, that's how we're able to discriminate things in the same way that our eyes discriminate things. But we can map all those out and that creates what's called a spectral signature. So across the bottom uh, here, we can see three different spectral signatures for very different surface types. So this is what soil looks like across the electromagnetic spectrum. It's relatively dark across the uh, uh, visible bands, and it gets brighter and brighter as we go out into the middle infrared and beyond, uh, because it, it, particularly if it's dry soil. In contrast, vegetation, the green line, um, it has a, you know, a little bump around green reflectance. That's why it looks green dust, but it has a big bump around near infrared reflectance. And, and then different uh, reactions out in the middle of red. Water's just dark across everything. But this is spectral signature underpins almost everything that we do with remote sensing depends on these um, multispectral observations being different for different constituents of Earth. 
So just to recap, uh, we can then move on to actual products. Uh, sensors have spatial, temporal, radiometric, and spectral resolutions that affect the way that they can be used. Um, the level zero product um, is usually surface reflectance, but that has to be estimated, and there's a lot of errors along the way. Uh, pixels aren't real things on the ground, right? Um, they're just a relatively arbitrary gridding procedure whereby we convert the observations that we see for a fuzzy area on Earth into a discrete uh, single value. Um, but keep in mind that they're, they're not real uh, and we don't even know where they are sometimes, right? We do our very best to know where they are, but uh, there's some error involved in that. Sometimes we're quite wrong. Um, but then almost all remote sensing from there on is based on these spectral signatures, which is this, the reflectance across the electromagnetic spectrum. So let's make a map of land cover just to kind of go through the process and understand where the errors come from and uh, get a sense for the types of errors in products. Now I choose land cover for a couple of reasons. It's as I mentioned before, probably the most used remote sensing product, regardless if it's the MODIS product in particular or, or some other products. Um, almost all ecological modeling exercises, land cover change uh, analyses, things like that need to start with a map of you know, what's where. So this little you know, really bad flow chart kind of shows the, the overall process. So the first step on the upper left, we need to decide on a schema. We need to decide on which types of things we're going to map. And this has a big impact on everything downstream. Uh, you can imagine designing a really, really uh, complicated schema where we want to separate sunflowers from tulips, from uh, soybeans, and we want to separate uh, you know, concrete from asphalt and things like that. Um, or we could prefer a schema that might be more appropriate for a really large area. And we want to say, well, is it forest or not forest or something like that, vegetated, not vegetated. So we have to decide on a schema. And then once we've decided on this schema, we need to collect reference information, uh, the training data for our, for our future classifiers. So this shows an example of the 3,095 sites that are used to create the MODIS land cover product. Uh, where they're located on Earth. And so most of the time, this is generated from users looking at high resolution imagery. So we'll throw out random points, although the, the actual nature of the sampling design is quite important. Uh, but we'll throw down random points and have people interpret the points and say, well, this is uh, forest, or this is rangeland, or this is cropland. And then from there, we get reference spectral signatures out of the images. Now, it doesn't have to just be images. Um, it could also be covariates like elevation or nighttime lights or anything that can help us discriminate between these different categories. But we extract these signatures, what these things look like across the, the spectral reflectance and the, um, and the other covariates. And that, perform, that, that gives us examples, uh, archetypes of these things at which we attempt to apply them through a classifier to every single pixel on earth for which we have, um, they have their own spectral signature. And we just say, basically, what does it look like the most, right? So at every step, <laughs> every box here um, has some important considerations. Um, the classifier itself, um, I've intentionally made that a black box. Uh, there's so many different ways to do that. But right now, we're mainly relying on machine learning methods. Um, typically not, unless it's a really high resolution product, convolutional neural networks, but things like random forest or uh, classification and regression trees, things like that are most often used for the classifier. And then out the other side comes this beautiful land cover map where we have a value of, of one of these different um, schema for every single pixel on Earth. Okay, great, so we've made a land cover map. Let's take a look at one particular land cover map to see where things might go wrong. So I'm going to pick on the MODIS land cover product um, here because I was involved in creating it, so I feel okay um, trashing it a little bit. Um, also, it's far and away the, the most used land cover product for global scale studies. So um, chances are some of you have encountered it, even if you weren't aware of it uh, thus far. So um, it provides a couple of different schemas. Uh, that's one unique uh, unique aspect of this particular product is you can have different schemas for the earth. But here shows the most used one, which is the IG, IGBP or the International Geosphere Biosphere Program schema, along with the definition. So I know it's an eye chart, but, but just keep in mind that uh, what I want you to draw from this is that there's a each of these different classes is not equally different from each other, right? So we have water bodies, we have permanent snow and ice, we have barren lands, 
those are all pretty distinct from each other and from everything else. But we also have things like mixed forests, <laughs> right? So here we even have a continuous variable mixed in with categorical variables. So obviously mixed forest is, a, is meant to be a mix of deciduous and evergreen. Almost all forests are some level of mixture, right? And so that's a continuous variable. So we have to come up with these definitions for these things. So in, what I mean to say here is that mixed forest is not as different from deciduous broadleaf forest or evergreen needleleaf forest as permanent snow and ice is from croplands, right? So you might expect that we have differing amounts of accuracy for different classes. And um, you also might see that the schema is very important, in particular, the definition of these when you go to use the product. So what does it mean for it to be deciduous broadleaf forest? Well, for MODIS, uh, for the MODIS land cover product, that means that there's greater than 60% tree cover of deciduous broadleaf trees and that the canopy is over two meters. So that gives you the stature of the vegetation, the fraction of coverage, and so on. So anything else would, you know, if it's deciduous broadleaf, but it's 59%, it's gonna be in some other category like woody savannas or something like that, right? So some of these categories are kind of confusing. Then we have this one, the best example is croplands natural vegetation mosaic, <laughs> right? So that's kind of everywhere around where we live, kind of looks like that sort of croplands natural vegetation mosaic. So there's very specific categories, there's less specific categories, um, and we might expect that to result in different amounts of accuracy per class. And indeed, that's what we see. So here, um, apologies for the garish colors, but they are actually the colors that are officially assigned for the, for the map. But across the bottom of the little, the codes for the IGBP, ENF is evergreen needle leaf forest, for instance, DBF is deciduous broadleaf, wet, wetlands, uh, SAV savannas, and so on. And then each of the bars represents the producer's accuracy and the user's accuracy for each of these classes. Now, the producers and the user's accuracy, it's a little bit of a jargon. When we go to assess maps, there's two different ways to look at the accuracy. If you look at it from the producer's perspective, what I care about as a map producer is, what's the probability that something that's really forest was mapped as forest, okay? But if you're the user of the map, the, what you're interested in is, what's the probability that something that's mapped as forest is actually forest? There's a difference between those two things. It's a trade-off between commission errors or an omission errors. So either commit, uh, incorrectly commit a pixel to a class in which it doesn't belong and thereby omit it from another class or vice versa. So if, if, if it's a new concept to you, just think about the cartoon case. If I'm a producer, um, what I care about is, and, and I'm trying to map water for instance, if I want to maximize that producer's accuracy, it means that I want to make sure that everything on the landscape that is water is mapped as water. And so if all I cared about was maximizing producer's accuracy, the map I would produce would say every single pixel was water. That would result in 100% producer's accuracy because everything in the real world that was water was mapped as water, right? It's not a very useful map, but it has 100% producer's accuracy. From the user's accuracy standpoint, right, where I care what is mapped as water, is it really water if I go out into the field, obviously that map would have low user's accuracy. So on the other end of the scale, if you're trying to maximize the user's accuracy, you might map only the wateriest of pixels as belonging to the water class. And that way, when someone finds a pixel that's classified as water and goes out to the field, we can be certain that it really is water but we're gonna omit a lot of other water there, right? The, the watery, but not the wateriest pixels, right? So that, if, if that's helpful to think about the difference between producers and users accuracy, um, thinking about that, that toy example. We're generally trying to balance these, but there are application specific um, examples you can give where you would prefer one over the other. Um, but one thing you can see from this chart is first, there are sometimes big differences between producers and users accuracy. I draw your attention to the wetlands class or the urban class. Wetlands has very low producers accuracy, right? Which means that we miss a lot of wetlands, right? There's a lot of wetlands on the landscape that don't get the label wetlands. It has pretty high users accuracy, which means that if I map something as wetlands, you can take it to the bank that it's a wetland. But this means that I'm under mapping a lot of wetlands. Same situation for, for urban areas, right? Um, we, we typically under map those. Uh, on, in contrast, evergreen needle leaf forests, we probably overmap those, right? Oh, sorry, I, I give you the wrong, wrong example. The evergreen broadleaf forests, maybe slightly um, overmapping of those. But there's a trade-off between these 
uh, producers and users accuracy. And now we're kind of in the weeds of, of, of where the maps go wrong and how we know that they're wrong. The other thing you want to note from here is there's a big difference among accuracies across classes. Okay, so there's some classes that have relatively high producers accuracies, evergreen broadleaf forest, relatively high. Um, but compare that to something like open shrublands, OSH right here, you know, about a coin flip, whether or not um, something that's actually an open shrubland was classified as such, and kind of a coin flip, whether something that's mapped is that it actually ends up being that, right? So not all of these classes are equally um, accurate, right? So again, the things that I pointed out is easy, snow, barren, water, generally pretty high um, classification accuracy. Um, other things that are more difficult, wood, woody savannas, open shrublands, savannas, grasslands, these are all um, uh, pretty confusing. Going back to this, right, so this is kind of what it looks like when things go wrong. We've got a lot of cropland in Rome, uh, probably not. Um, just one more example to pick on the, the GFSAD product um, a little bit closer to home. This is one of my favorite examples. So it's mapped uh, a lot of Dix Park as croplands, but not the only actual cropland in Dix Park. <laughs> the sunflower field here is actual cropland, and it is uh, conspicuously um, <laughs> not mapped as cropland, so the entire surrounding area is, right? So things go wrong. This doesn't mean that this is necessarily a bad product. Um, I think rather this is pretty typical of global scale products. If you're trying to classify every 30 meter pixel on earth with a sort of one size fits all algorithm, um, if you zoom in on any particular area, I guarantee you're gonna find some trouble, right? But when you go out to these large scales, um, we say things like, well, it's 70% accurate, right? It's 80% accurate. Right? Um, so be wary of the bumper sticker numbers that come along with these data products when they say the overall accuracy is 98%. Um, well, you should ask a lot of questions about that. How did you determine that, right? So think about uh, a sampling design where we went out and we wanted to get some reference data with which to validate or assess the accuracy of a classified map. Um, how will we collect those data? Um, should we just do a random sample? Should we do a stratified random sample by particular classes? Does it matter? Do you care about one particular class more than all the others, right? So a lot of this goes into it. And things, things that are really easy, like water. Well, if I want to really pump up my overall accuracy, let's just put a million reference sites, uh, validation sites in water. I guarantee I'll get almost all of them right. And so then my overall accuracy is really inflated. I get everything else wrong, right? But I've got those right and I can, I can uh, bandy around the idea that I have a high overall accuracy. So be skeptical of those bumper sticker numbers. Um, this is a, an eye chart, but I've, I've, I've um, highlighted what I want you to see here. This is from the National Land Cover Data Set, which is um, a product that's available for different eras. Uh, it's not available every year, but there's a product for 2006, a product for 2011, basically uh, representing the land cover over the coterminous United States uh, over the, that five-year sort of chunks. And this is a really highly used product. Um, for a very long time, it was the only 30 meter operationally produced um, product. So the only one that somebody could download and use. 30 meters is a really you know, good data uh, spatial resolution for local to regional studies. Um, thing for a lot of these studies, 500 meters or 1,000 meters from MODIS would be much too, too coarse. So NLCD has gotten a lot of use. It's also a really shining example of validation um, they've done a really great job. They have really talented statisticians working on this sort of thing. And we know very well how good or bad uh, the product is. And so this is one of these confusion matrices, which I don't know if it's, that's jargon specific or not, but it's a simple cross tab of the reference data of um, what, was, what it was in reality versus what it was mapped, right? So down at the bottom are the producer's accuracies for each of these individual classes. And apologies, the classes are coded. Um, by number rather than name, but these are all different things like 11 is water and 21 is, um, you know, open development and 41 is deciduous broadly forest. But look across the producer's accuracy. Some of them are really low, right? A hundred percent for permanent snow and ice, 81 percent for water, but then we can go down to 31 percent for 43, which is mixed forest. Again, these classes, and this originates from the definitions. The definitions are, are a bit obscure. You might even have trouble 
walking out into the field <laughs> and determining whether something is a mixed forest or deciduous, probably forest or evergreen needle leaf forest. So from the satellite perspective, it's going to be pretty hard too. Likewise for the user's accuracies, and you can also see some pretty substantial differences between the user's accuracies across class. 100% producers, 20% users, right? Uh, but you know, ranging from 89% down to um, you know 29% accuracy in the user's uh, accuracy, right? So uneven accuracy across classes, uneven users and producers accuracies. So be very skeptical of single numbers that that are intended to communicate the accuracy of a land cover product. Um, the NLCD land cover product has an overall accuracy of, you know, close to 70%, depending on what year you look at. If you include the secondary label, say, you know, it, it, we think it's this, but we think it might be this too, right? Like a secondary label, the accuracy further increases to about 82%, um, but still large unevenness across classes and between producers and users' perspectives. Another problem with the errors in the maps is that they're not spatially random all the time, right? And here's how another zoom in from uh, NLCD uh, assessment document shows the accuracies here that I'm pointing out between pixel level results uh, for a random region versus a hand selected region that was highly homogeneous, right? So if we go to areas where things are really homogeneous, like maybe these crop fields over here, it stands to reason we'd have a pretty good e easy time classifying them. When things get all mixed up, like over here, we may have a pixel that includes a you know 20% of this water, maybe 10% of this beach, maybe a little bit of the crop field, maybe um, mostly uh, forest. Well, then things become quite different, right? So you can see that the accuracies increase in homogeneous areas, and in areas where there's a lot of heterogeneity, they decrease. Okay, um, so the errors are not spatially random, and that can create some issues in, in the way that we use them. Spatial resolution of the product themselves, that's fairly straightforward, important, but I uh, want to highlight just so you can see what they look like here. White pixels are MODIS and the red are Landsets. You can just get a feel for that over uh, New York Botanical Gardens. And, and this is, uh, and then another area in the Shenandoah Wilderness and then uh, Florida State University here. So you can see like within a MODIS pixel, there's a lot of heterogeneity. What do you call this, right? Well, there's some forest here. There's some barren land here. There's some parking lots. There's roads. I, you know, it, it'd be hard pressed to, to, to um, confidently assign a label to these things. So, so you can just understand where some of these um, ambiguities and confusion and errors come from uh, by appreciating the spatial resolution with respect to the actual landscape. And indeed, it has a big impact on the way that we um, interpret and the, the inference that we get from these products. So this is a pretty good paper that came out recently um, that used a 30 meter forest fragmentation data set or a 30 meter map of forest and a one meter map of forest, both created from remotely sensed data to analyze forest fragmentation. And you know, there's no surprise here, but the spatial resolution had a huge impact on the, the amount of forest mapped, the amount of intact forest, and even the inference about things, how things were changing over time. As you went down to the finer and finer spatial resolution, um, you found more forest overall, but you found less intact forest. Um, so it really changes the inference about how forests are changing just based on the, the mapping unit, the spatial resolution, uh, which of course influences the, the schema and the definitions of the land cover. Again, the definitions matter and they're very inconsistent. So there's a lot of different land cover products over here, the NLCD schema on the left side, four different schemas, just a, a, a shot of this really large table. I'm um, showing the different definitions for things that are called the same thing, <laughs> right? So uh, we have differences in the canopy fraction and the canopy height. So what is shrublands in one pixel um, based on definition might be a deciduous broadly forest in another. Um, so be careful when you go across data sets as well. One way that we're working on solving that is hierarchical uh, classification schema. So the new version of MODIS land cover uses this hierarchical schema and you can walk your way up through the schema at every level of the hierarchy. When you go up, you, you can expect to be more accurate because there are less specific definitions. And so you can um, choose uh, the highest level uh, in the hierarchy necessary for your, for, your, um, for your application. So that's just making a single land cover map. Most of us are interested in how things are changing. Well, <laughs> change is really hard. And one of the main reasons is for all the reasons that we just talked about. If we, if we have a hard time making a map at one time, um, we're going to have even harder time saying how things have changed through time, uh, particularly if we're going to do it 
on the basis of comparing one map to another, which is what we've done for the longest time. So here are the National Land Cover Data Set uh, Assessment Table, just looking at the accuracies, uh, producers and users' accuracy for change uh, of different types. So water loss or gain, grass, the forest loss or gain. So you can see very different class accuracies and overall moderate to, to, um, to low, I guess we could say moderate uh, accuracies, right? So something is mapped as forest loss, maybe it's from a user's perspective, only 82% chance that it actually happened. 38% uh, chance that ag gain uh, map is, is actually true. So change is pretty hard. How does that look on the landscape? Well, here's the MODIS land cover product. And what we see in collection six is the current collection, C6 up top, C5 down below, or right and left um, uh, on the, the right-hand image. The pink mapping shows the number of label changes for that particular place through time. So in collection five, we're just mapping individual, you know, using 2010 data to map 2010, 2011 to map 2011. And what we end up with is a lot of change here. A lot, you see a lot of pink down here. And these are pixels that are changing from savannas to grasslands to, to forests, back to savannas, to grasslands, to forests, in an unrealistic way. A lot of these are even illogical changes, right? So we might bounce around between two different categories. This is not real change, right? This is real uncertainty in assigning a label to a pixel, okay? Um, in C6, uh, collection six, we've done a little bit better because we've been able to stabilize things. One of the main reasons is, as I said, spectral signatures. Uh, that's how we discriminate between these things. This is the ideal, but this is the reality. Um, we don't see it continuously. We only see it in specific little parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. And a lot of these signatures are frustratingly close together. Um, they look very similar to each other. So that just makes it hard. So in the end, we tend to map more change than is realistic. Again, the number of label changes here on the bottom uh, here, uh, all the red are places that have had five or more label changes. Now, it, just in a you know a 10 year time period, these places are not changing every two years. It, it's just, this is inconsistency or, or inaccuracies in the input methods maps. And then at the end, once we've stabilized it, so we've actually come up with this stabilization procedure, which is, you know, I, it was it was a good idea. It works um, fairly well to stabilize these changes, um, but I think we have a better solution that I'll tell you about in a moment. I'll skip this in the interest of time, but this is just showing how the, the things change and how we stabilize them. But we're in a new era now, and so we can do change better. And I know most of you are interested in change, and so that's why I'll spend a moment talking about change and, and the the, the sort of frontiers of that work right now. We have all available Landsat data is, 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 is available for, for analysis now. It used to not be the case. Um, we used to have to pay $600 per Landsat scene to, you know, at, for a brief period, over $4,000 per each individual Landsat seen. I, I note here when I went to grad school because I wrote my entire dissertation on two Landsat images which we had to buy. Now if you're going to have to buy the images, you're not going to pay for this, right? You're not going to pay $600 for this. There's very little usable data in it. It's mostly covered in clouds. Um, so what we ended up with was a lot of methods built on how to extract the most blood from a single stone, right? So we would get the very best cloud-free images that we could um, and then we would, we would try to get as much uh, inference out of those images as we can. But now we have tons and tons of data available and so and freely available. So you know just as a point of reference, like I said, I wrote my dissertation on two landside images and just earlier this morning I was helping one of my graduate students um, set up a script to download about 30,000 landside images, right? So it's been a revolutionary change. And one of the things that's allowed us to do is to transition to time series based methods for change detection. And so um, the seminal work on this is uh, CCDC algorithm, continuous change detection and classification. Uh, one of the dissertation papers from uh, Dr. Jeju there, uh, we were at Boston University together um, when he was doing this and it's lightning in a bottle. Uh, it, the, the core idea is that if you have every available Landsat observation, you can fit a time series model that tells you how things change. And so you can project forward and say, this is what I think the next Landsat observation should look like. And when it starts to deviate substantially and persistently from what we expect, like you can see for these green points here, they stray quite far from the prediction. 
then we start to become confident that something has really changed. This is much less susceptible to random errors and assignment, or, you know, just to small radiometric errors. Uh, I might assign a pixel to croplands and then the next image comes along. It's slightly different, even though the surface hasn't changed, it just looks different. Maybe we miss some aerosols, maybe it's a cloud shadow. And now instead of being assigned to, uh, to shrublands, it's assigned to grasslands and we say it changed, even though it didn't. Well, this is much less susceptible to that sort of uh, sort of thing. And this is um, the way forward, I think, both for change detection in particular, but also classification. Um, so you can produce maps like this. So not only is it more accurate, it can also tell us when something changed with pretty high specificity. So down to the observation, we can tell uh, we can tell you when we think uh, things change. So this map in the middle, the colors indicate the timing of the change. Um, and over here, we can say divide these time series up into discrete stable segments uh, during which no changes happen and use the properties of the time series fit itself, the parameters of that model to actually map these to, to classify. This is a much, much better way to, to do change. And it's the way that we're, we're all doing it going forward. It, it relies on some, some big uh, upstream assumptions, right? We need to be able to very efficiently mask clouds and shadows. If you only have two images, you can just spend the afternoon hand delineating and masking out all the clouds. If you're gonna use 30,000 images, you better be able to teach the computer to do that for you. Um, Jay also figured that out, <laughs> which is quite nice. Um, with this algorithm, so I'll just skip right over it. But we have a pretty good way of of, class, of finding and masking out clouds now, though it is not 100% accurate. Um, so how much time do I have? I think I'm just going to skip over this section. Um, talking about phonology, we're going to higher resolutions, time series methods. The only this this I want to dwell on. This is some work from my student um, using time series. We want to be able to figure out when spring came and when fall came, it's important for a variety of reasons, not just for leaf looking and uh, pollen season. But uh, you know, if you're trying to predict crop yields and stuff like that, you need to know when crops started to emerge. We'd like to be able to do this at high resolution over long periods of time. Landsat archive allows us to do that. But as you can see on the left, we have a lot of different data density in the different years. Some years we have multiple Landsats operating. Sometimes we have uh, even other uh, Landsat-like sensor, sensors like Sentinel operating. We have a lot of observations. Sometimes we just don't have a lot of observations. And so that affects how well we can fit these models. Now, most of the phonology products available just give you a number and don't tell you anything about how uncertain that number may be. So Jay has been working really hard at this and has come up with this Bayesian hierarchical approach. I think it's really nice. Um, we're really favoring Bayesian methods going forward because we can handle these situations and um, we get uncertainty in our products. Uh, it just kind of comes along for the ride. So I think that this is the way forward. So this is just sort of, after I've shown you all the trouble and the problems and how bad we are at our job, show you that we're, we're actually working on it. And I think there's some reason uh, for improvement. We're also getting better at working with multiple satellites together. As I said, you know, we have 700 Earth observation satellites. Can we use them together in some way? Um, here's some data fusion work that we've been working on here. It's subtle, but this is now daily sort of changing. This is one crop season in Bihar, India that we've created. Now you can't see this um, normally the images don't look like this these are all synthetic images most of the images have abundant cloud cover we're also but we're actually fusing together modus landsat sentinel and even planet scope so if you zoom in we get really high resolution individual tree canopies very important for the work we're doing in this area where fields are very very small and we need to know when they started greening up for instance so anyway just to say we're getting better time series um, approaches to product generation have been revolutionary. We're getting better now, though we're not quite there with using multiple heterogeneous sensors, disparate sensor data together. Um, again, I think Bayesian methods are, are really important here. So just time to be a, remote, uh, a user of remotely sensed data, but remain skeptical. Uh, products are high quality and you should use them. And there have never been more of them and they've never been more accessible. Um, but there are errors and you should be very skeptical, uh, particularly of single numbers that, that uh, attempt to relate the accuracy of, of a land cover product. For instance, if you said the NLCD product is 70% accurate and therefore this map of forest change that I got from these two maps of NLCD is also 70% accurate, you would be in error. Um, the time series revolution is solving a lot of these problems, although it's creating some new ones for us, mainly in compute. Um, big opportunities uh, in multi-sensor. 
a lot of these products have QA, QC data. And just as a product producer, I produce the phenology product and the land cover product. One of my um, pet peeves is we spend a lot of time trying to produce QA, QC data. Most products don't have them, um, but some of them do. And it seems that people just ignore it, right? People want the number um, and they don't want to throw data away. But, but please see if the products you're interested in have uh, quality assessment or quality control data or even uncertainty data, and please use it. Uh, it, it's a little bit troublesome, but it, but it's worthwhile. Um, and then from you know from a user side, insist that the producers validate their data and insist that they provide QA QC data when they don't. You know, harangue them until they do. I, I get a lot of emails every day about products, and I'm always happy to get them. So so please communicate with the product producers about your desires. And the last point I want to make is that we do care about this. I'm part of this um, land product validation subgroup. It's an international effort. Um, to validate and assess in a very structured and systematic way all of the different land products that we create um, from satellites. So for the phenology products, from land cover products, from lead fairy index. Um, we spend a lot of time thinking about this. We're trying to get better at it. And we're, um, there's some, some really good resources. If you're interested in putting confidence intervals on, on land cover change products, this paper in the bottom right is the gold standard right now. Uh, Pontus Olofsson from Boston University 2014 wrote this paper. It's a really, it, it, I think it's made its way into the Red Plus framework um, for assessing uh, forest change. Uh, very important work uh, there and a good uh, kind of primer on, on how to use confusion matrices to assess land cover products. And uh, so with that, I think I can uh, take some questions if there are any. I think I saved a few minutes anyway. Um, Josh, I'll um, I'll ask a question here. Um, so uh, you were speaking mostly about um, some of these land use ones, um, but the uh, I'm noticing a lot of also sort of air quality ones as well, particularly like trying to do PM particulate matter uh, uh, work. I mean, is there any sense of these issues being relatively transferable there as well, um, or better or worse, uh, in your opinion? Yeah, um, that's a great question, Harrison. Thank you. Um, I don't do a lot of atmospheric remote sensing, so I'm not familiar with the accuracy levels or our validation status of a lot of those products. I chose land cover because I think it highlights all of the things that can go wrong, right? Um, because there's so many, you know, the definitions, the spatial resolution, the, the input error and the radiometric error, the distinctiveness of different spectral signatures, it kind of shows you all the different ways. Some or all of those apply to all these other products, right? Certainly for an air quality product, aerosol product, for instance, uh, the radiometric accuracy matters, right? So how well can we retrieve the brightness of the atmosphere? Um, so, and, and indeed, a lot of our downstream products depend on that the error in that, right? Because if we're going to try to go for surface reflectance, we need to know how much stuff is in the atmosphere. Um, so yeah, they, they have errors. Uh, I think we're getting better and better at that. Where we have uh, instruments with uh, higher precision. We know better where the satellites are looking. Uh, we have a better ground network of reference data. Um, but yeah, there, there's still going to be errors in that. And I'm not sure. I have a feeling for something like particulate matter at a particular like 700 millibar height, probably hard to get a lot of samples to re really rigorously evaluate that. Um, so you'd probably be limited um, in, in how much validation is available. Josh, I guess I have a question. Uh, so I'm, I'm working, for example, with, with cover crops and sort of like remotely sensed data on cover crops in the winter, for example. So uh, I'm not at that level of the pixels, but I, I use data products that aggregate up to say the county level, for example, and run my statistical analysis that way. I mean, what's your feel for the errors? Of, well, I don't know, what, what's, what's your feel for using more aggregate remote sensing data for your analysis rather than the pixel level data sets for, for doing analysis, especially for economists? Yeah, I try to avoid this a little bit because it's it's a it's a thorny issue, uh, scaling issues, right? So um, some things would just scale up just fine, right? The errors would be random and they would cancel, but 
a lot of time the errors are not random and sometimes the scaling is, is nonlinear. So for instance, we know, I do a lot of work on phonology, so I'll draw an example from phonology. So if we make a map of phonology at 30 meters and then compare it to what we see at 500 meters from MODIS, you might expect that MODIS sort of hits its green up when half of the pixels, for instance, at finer resolution hit their green up, but it's not the case. It actually hits its sort of green up uh, trigger, the same threshold for the same algorithm, when only 25% of the pixels have greened up. So the scaling relationships are not always linear. Um, so I would be wary of that, and I would probably try to test, test that assumption. Uh, a lot of times, the land cover maps, you're just trying to say, well, how many of these pixels are, have cover crop or not? Um, you might be worried about edge effects, right? So there's a lot of, uh, of work that's been done on how do we add these things up when we know that they have errors, right? So, so the assumption is generally that, you know, there'll be a pixel that's 50-50 and here I'll classify it as cover and here I'll classify it as not cover crop and those will cancel each other out. It may not always be the case. And it interacts a lot with the spatial resolution and the definitions used on underlying. So there's, it's hard to give a sort of blanket statement for, for um, without knowing the specific data sets, but I'd be happy to work with you, Roderick, on that. That's something pretty close to, to home for me. We, we do a lot of work on agriculture and we're increasingly interested in carbon sequestration and soils. Um, and so cover crops are a big, a big way. Yeah, so I mean that that's my interest as well, and it, and that's the that's the problem with cover crops, for example. Uh, there's not a whole lot of data that's sort of like uh, on a yearly scale, so we're relying on remote sensing data rather than, say, for example, an ag census data. Uh, and so that's sort of uh, the downside. I guess that's the good side for the remote sensing, but we agree that there may be issues there, and I'm sort of exploring different kinds of products. I I'll touch base with you, Josh. Thank thanks. That'd be good. Thanks for the question, Robert. And Josh, let me just ask a quick follow-up from the chat. What about aggregating the categories? I mean, you sort of showed that hierarchical model. Mm -hmm. um, is it the case that aggregating by categories sort of back up in some way increases accuracy or how should we, or reduces mismeasurement? Yeah, almost always. Almost always it does. And there's some, for particular products, there's standardized ways of doing that. There's a crosswalk schema from NLCD to a higher level called the Anderson 1, really core scale thing. And there's a pretty... It was designed it, not explicitly as a hierarchical thing, but with that in mind that there's a way to crosswalk it. Um, so the definitions are compatible at the higher and lower levels. I think we, we were on a call um, maybe six months ago with a lot of the people, the usual suspects to create who will be creating the land cover products. And we all agree that the hierarchical schema are the way forward. And so I think there's good reason to think that we'll be able to take advantage of that going into the future. But at least the modus link of our product is hierarchical and allows you to walk up that. But yeah, absolutely. As you go up and up, you know, less specificity, you're going to get more accurate every time. But, but again, the, the overall point I'm trying to make is that you know, the modus link of our product is 80% accurate, or it's 100% accurate, or it's 1% accurate. It, you know, it depends on how you validate it, what you're interested in, right? Um, so be very wary and skeptical of single numbers that, that attempt to communicate the uncertainty for particularly land cover products. Even, the, even just like the baseline measurements, right? So surface reflectance, you'd think we'd have a pretty good idea how wrong we are. And we do, but we only know it for particular areas, right? You can't go out and measure the surface reflectance over a very heterogeneous area. So we try to find really homogeneous areas and measure it at a little tiny part of that, but there's not a lot of those. And most of them are really these big bright targets, like these like railroad playas, like one of the test cases. So we know how bad we are over really homogeneous Lambertian bright surfaces. The other ones, we don't know. We hope it's the same. <laughs> Just a follow-up comment on what you said, though. But you know, reviewers act, ultimately ask, how accurate is this remote sensing data anyway? And of course, you sort of rely on the experts' numbers that they use and say, OK, they said it's whatever, 70%. And you know, I guess the reviewers don't know any better anyway. But still, that, that's, that's the problem sometimes. Uh, reviewers are the worst. But um, <laughs> I, as a practical recommendation, I'd say check out that CIOS LPV website, um, the Community on Earth Observation Systems Land Product Validation Team. It's a mouthful. Um, NASA loves acronyms. But uh, there you is kind of the clearinghouse for all the definitive information and the status of the products um, where you can quickly locate that, that information if it exists, right? And, and all these products are at different stages of validation and have different amounts of data available. But that would be the first stop for that sort of information. Because we care, we're trying. <laughs> 
All right. Well, I think we're at the end of our time. So for everyone who's hung on till the end, thank you. Uh, and Josh, thank you so much. Uh, I'm sure some there will be some follow up. I know I have a, some questions I'm going to follow up with you on. Uh, so thanks again. And uh, thanks everyone for attending. Yeah, thank you all for your attention. And thanks, Eric, and the rest of the group for the opportunity. I really appreciate it. Have a great day, y'all.